welcome to the 33rd lecture in the English lecture series at Otago University of Commerce. Today, we're pleased to welcome Ms. Misaki Kodama. She is a PhD candidate at Nagoya University. For her topic today is the role of Japanese assistance in trade to developing countries, how we can get involved. Please welcome Ms. Misaki Kodama. chose this topic and why I pick up those three organizations uh, relating to trade development assistance. Um, I've been studying and working in the trade development issues for um, more than more than seven years. And um, especially I was serving uh, at the Jap uh, Mission of Japan in Geneva for two years. I just came back uh, last December from Geneva. And I was attending uh, the meetings, uh, negotiation meetings, uh, or uh, intergovernmental, or um, how do you say, like expert meetings, or conferences as a uh, representative of Japan. Um, um, and I, also, I was also in charge of assessing the activities of those three organizations in Geneva. From what I have learned from my experience in Geneva and uh, research for seven years, I would like to discuss um, the importance of trade assistance and how the representation of Japan in Geneva in the trade front. And uh, finally, to introduce how we can get involved in this uh, trade field. So, um, sustainable development is often discussed in uh, envir environmental aspects, uh, such as preservation of natural resources, uh, deforestation, deforestation, and so on, especially towards uh, Rio Plus 20, which is the conference, uh, International Conference on Sustainable Development this year. However, I would insist that the sustainable economic development is very important to achieve effective and meaningful growth for developing countries, and as well as to get out of poverty. Um, sustainable development should be achieved in an inclusive way. All the aspects of, um, as you can see, it's very small, but environment, economy, and society. Having said this, it should be well known that the trade is engine for growth. As you can easily imagine, all those uh, newly industrialized countries like four Asian tigers in China and Brazil have achieved substantial economic growth through a trade liberalization under the multilateral trading, trading scheme. Uh, on the contrary, Smaller developing countries, um, like least developed countries, LDCs, or uh, small scale econ economies, 
face major difficulties in, uh, uh, in, uh, in achieving growth, such as substantially low uh, share of the world margins exports or little invest FDI flows to those countries. While the LDCs have achieved a uh, higher recovery from 2008 financial crisis than expected. So, uh, in this chart, the line of LDC is very unclear, but in the light purple, very down, down beneath, uh, it's almost close to zero. Uh, it's a little bit higher than zero, but it's very close. Even though quarter of all the countries in the world are LDCs. While export share of developing countries has been increasing substantially, it's in the, you know, the light yellow in the middle, um, increasing up to 45% in 2010, um, that of LDCs remains uh, about 1%. The same story goes for low-income developing countries. Um, compared to other higher category of developing countries, like high-income countries or middle-income countries, uh, they, they have been struggling to achieve substantial growth for decades. Uh, in order to help them achieve more effective growth through a trade liberalization under the multilateral trading system, Japan provides trade assistance through three organizations, as I mentioned in the introduction part, WTO, uh, UNCTAD, and ITC. UNCTAD stands for the United Nations uh, United Nation Conference on Trade and Development. <coughs> and ITC is the joint center of the WTO and UNCTAD, uh, stands for International Trade Center. Okay, I would like to start from the trade assistance uh, Japan provides under the WTO. So, uh, under the WTO scheme, April trade is the major development assistance that Japan provides. April trade is defined as a broad set of assistance, assistance expenditure categories as indication of donor activities, which impact on partner countries' trade capacity. Well, it sounds quite complicated, but in short, this assistance goes to uh, this assistance aims to promote trade of developing countries, especially the exports. Um, the aidful trade is provided under uh, through sorry uh, through bilateral ODA offshore development assistance and uh, the. the fund to multilateral development agencies. Like the multilateral development agency includes regional development banks like Asian Development Bank, uh, African Development Bank, and even Islamic Development Bank. So uh, for Japan, uh, among those development banks, Asian Development Banks is the focal point and makes quite a amount of contribution. Uh, besides, the WTO has established and operationalized the enhanced integrated framework uh, which manages and implements the project, uh, a for trade project, uh, especially for LDCs least developed countries. So uh, through aid for trade, Japan assists developing countries mainly in those three categories. Uh, trade related infrastructure such as uh, building ports, railways, and even power plants and irrigation. And the second one is soft assistance. Um, it helps developing countries to build the trade capacity including the, make, the policy makings or uh, the regulations and even investment promotions. A third category is uh, building productive capacity. This is a capacity on supply side, means 
you know, the help industries to grow up or achieve or, um, how do you say, gain the export competitiveness so that they can compete in the international markets. Um, Japan announced the uh, development initiative for trade in 2005. Uh, there was a Hong Kong Ministerial, uh, Ministerial Conference December in 2005. Uh, in, a little bit before that, Japan announced this initiative uh, by Prime Minister Koizumi. And under this, under this initiative, um, uh, they, uh, they help developing countries to, ex, uh, to promote export uh, of developing countries with inclusive scheme through three pillars of production, sale, and purchase. Uh, under this initiative, the government also announced one village, one product campaign. Um, how many of you have heard of this? Oh, good. <laughs> oh, just one, one person said anyway. Um, this, this campaign means that the Japan assists um, developing countries like one region or even one village to enhance the exports of one main product and then you know the export to other markets with you know like special like with sometimes with traditions but sometimes with uh, you know a little bit higher uh, value added products so that they can compete or they can be sold the, the, those products can be sold in the, another market. Anyway, so, and then WTO has another institute for soft capacity building, so-called Institute for Training and Technical Cooperation. Um, the budgetary resources are the, the what part of regular budget of the WTO and Global Trust Fund, which is a voluntary contribution of donors. Um, this institute specializes in capacity building on trade policy making, in negotiation capacity, and implementation of commitments and obligations that members uh, made when they acceded to the WTO. Uh, they provide some uh, national or regional seminars, workshops to uh, share the best practice or lessons or sort of uh, teach them how to commit, how to read the uh, agreements and stuff. And also they provide e-learning. <coughs> e-learning is a trade policy course provided online so that the diplomats or policy makers or even uh, some academics can learn uh, and enhance those capacity uh, even in distance. So, oops, anyway. I was gonna ask, like, where do you think Japan ranks as the donor of in, in the world than anyone? I already showed the, the chart. Um, Japan has been the largest donor of April trade among uh, all the individual countries. Well, World Bank is, of course, this is the international, uh, the, the biggest international financial uh, institution, and they also provide April trade, well, which is just a project, I mean, projects or a program to enhance trade, trade capacity. Uh, but um, it, as an individual country, Japan has been the largest uh, among the, those major donors. So, uh, even though contribution, as you can see, had substantially declined after 2008 financial crisis, but still Japan is the largest donor among those uh, donors. So, um, in the next slide, let's look at what category Japan provides a portrait in. So, uh, regarding with this aid for trade, uh, which category do you think Japan provides the trade assistance the most? Well, you can 
you can refer to those three categories of aid for trade. Which one is the largest, do you think? Well, Japan has quite characteristics, actually. These, these are hard, in infrastructure, uh, trade capacity building, and supply side productive capacity building. Supply side capacity. Good choice. Who else? You got sacrifice. Yeah, what's that? I also think it's supply side. Supply side capacity. Wow, okay. Well, it is important to build the supply side capacity. But, um, and then, you know, as Japan um, provides, announced those uh, initiatives and campaign, but in fact, Japan provides the most in infrastructure. Well, this is quite character characteristics in Japanese OTA so far, I mean, since the 80s. Uh, Japan loves, you know, building infrastructures. Uh, sometimes though, those OTAs have been criticized because it's tight, uh, tight assistance. Any, any of you know what tight ODA means? Tight ODA. Tight means, you know, like linked. So tight ODA means uh, when you provide assistance or to build infrastructure, Japan sort of uh, asks the developing countries to use Japanese company. Also that, you know, Japan can also benefit from, you know, like uh, making money out of the assistance. Well, that has been criticized since 90s and early 2000s. So um, we don't do any more tight. Uh, we do some, but not all the aid for trade uh, program is uh, tight, tight, uh, tight assistance. Um, and then Japan, Japanese assistance goes mostly to, as you can imagine, Asian countries, Asian developing countries. Um, talk, talking about the you know, amount of money, just for your information, under the title of development initiative for trade that I, I was mentioned earlier, uh, Japan announced the promotion of aid for trade related measure and fully implement, implemented the first initiative including uh, the disbursement, uh, the money they spent, of 10 billion US dollars for trade related uh, development assistance for the period of 2008, uh, no, sorry, 2006 to 2008. And for the period of 2009 to 2011, uh, Japan announced the, uh, announced the ODA project in trade totaling 12 billion US dollars. And then Japan announced that it's been implemented uh, fully update. So, um, next is the assistance under the UNCTAD. UNCTAD is the, as I told, UN uh, Conference on Trade and Development. So, UNCTAD, it used to be a focal point in discussing trade and development issues uh, since its established establishment in 1964. Uh, especially for developing countries, UNCTAD has been uh, let's say, very important forum to uh, gain the recognition of special needs of developing countries or special plan of uh, developing countries. The most successful example is the preferential market access. That means the developing countries can export the, their products with very low tariff. Um, they achieved the preferential market access in uh, 1970s under the WTO and under the GATT at the time. So uh, through this preferential market access, developing countries has achieved uh, substantial growth, like I told, 
uh, Asian tigers or the China and Brazil, like even like before to them. So, um, but now those function, uh, those like, how do you say, like uh, the no notable function got declined in Naksha. Well, as I saw, really saw in my eyes in Geneva, Angtad uh, is now the body to provide technical assistance to developing countries or uh, hold the expert meetings or intergovernmental meetings to share the best practice or lessons that, that other developing countries uh, has made. So, anyways, um, Japan has contributed to the project First one is called LDC project. Uh, the, this project was completed last year, actually, and with the recognition that export diversification remains a major challenge for developing countries, especially in Asia. Um, I'm sorry, LDCs in Asia, which is which are the Bangladesh, Bhutan, Cambodia, Laos. And Maldives, actually Maldives graduated last year, uh, January 2011, and Myanmar and Nepal. The aim of this project is to support, to strengthen dynamic and new exports of Asian LDCs. Um, and under this project, uh, funded by, by Japan, Angtad uh, conducted activities to identify new and dynamic exports and the type of non-tariff measures facing these exports. Um, in particular, this non-tariff measures includes like licensing or some standards when developing countries uh, they developing countries face when they try to export to the countries like Japan. Uh, we have high standard of sanitary measures, like, well, for instance, not the BSE, but, but when, you, when you take, if you take the apple, like, considering import from other, the other countries, uh, this apple has to meet some uh, sanitary standards to be allowed to export, I mean, to import it to Japan. So those one th that is the one example of non-tariff measures that like most developing countries face. You have you have taught in your class. So um, Angtad also uh, holds national and regional workshops and intergovernmental meetings to, as I said, to share the best practice and lessons. So the second project is called uh, Virtual Institute. Uh, countries at all stage of the government needs effective and uh, effective policy makers and negotiators with solid knowledge of international economic issues. They also need up-to-date information and, and analysis about uh, how the changes in the world economy influence to those countries and which policies could this could best respond to both uh, the opportunities and challenges. Uh, academic institutions such as universities or uh, and research institutes are a vital source of information and training in developing countries uh, they, they also educate future policy makers or negotiators or even business leaders and offer empirical research required for informed policy makings and negotiations. So with this recognition, Angstad established a special program of cooperation with academic institutions. The Angtad Virtual Institute program uh, was established in 2004, June. Uh, while initially virtual institutes uh, 
uh, has worked with only universities, but now uh, they enlarge the scope to uh, the research centers and uh, development think tanks. So uh, the Berger Institute is a capacity building and network networking program for academic institutions in developing and uh, transition economies. It aims to help them strengthen their teaching and research capacity in the area of trade, investment, and development, and increase the policy orientation and the relevance of the work. Um, Berger Institute has mainly three categories of activities. First one is support the degree program. The Berger Institute provides advice on the design of university courses and programs, and develops teaching materials on trade and development issues. And second one is professional development for research and teaching. Uh, which is offer, to offer training and learning opportunities for groups of academics and as well as individual students. And the third is cooperation with the other uh, virtual institute academic networks. In addition to working bilaterally, bilateral, bilaterally between universities, um, the virtual institute also uh, draws the potential of you know, the networking and support exchanges, experience, and joint projects among the universities or those research centers. So um, this, this project is quite appreciated and Japan is not only a donor. Like many of uh, developed countries have been contributing to this project and some um, uh, virtual institute university, uh, Japan was provided, uh, Japan provided the assistance in, for, in, for example, universities in India on trade in the environmental issue, or to Bangladesh for, um, or is it, I, don't, I don't quite remember, but to Bangladesh on, I think it was climate change issue. So the last one, uh, I'd like to talk about assistance under the International Trade Center. Uh, that as I told in the, in the introduction part, ITC stands for the International Trade Center, like the says in, on, on the, uh, up, up to there. Um, International Trade Center is a tr uh, joint center of WTO and ANCTA. They do, um, they do uh, the ethical fashion projects. Oh, sorry. Uh, they, their most, uh, most of their project is, is aiming to promote export through uh, business expansion or exports through uh, like providing, how do you say, like uh, assistance in export capacity building. So uh, Japan has provided uh, into this project called Ethical Fashion Project. Well, as I Google Ethical Fashion Project in, in ITC, I found some Japanese articles too. Does, has anybody heard of this Ethical Fashion Project? Like, Ethical fashion represents an approach to the design, sharing, and sourcing and manufacture of clothing and lifestyle products, blah, blah, blah. Anyway. But in short, they help the micro like manufacturers, uh, mostly the women in Africa, like Kenya, Uganda, to uh, export the products with Helping, you know, bringing in the brown designers and the large designers. And the example of uh, brown designers could be uh, is uh, uh, Vivian Westwood, 
um, Stella, Stella McCartney or uh, I cannot, Carmina Campus. Um, so this, the object of ethical fashion program is to uh, promote trade of sustainable fashion products between international uh, companies and micro manufacturers in Africa. Thus, uh, developing uh, local creativity, encouraging female employment and gender equality, and in doing so, reducing extreme poverty at, at, the, at the end. So, uh, now I might want to show uh, some video of the ITC project by the Vivian Westbrook. It's about five minutes. Well, the microphone is not connected, but... Is it available? Yeah, I think so. What I've just realised by coming here, that it's actually what I do, it's earrings, and it's making my clothes, that is something that it can make a difference to where I am in the middle of Africa. We are not interested in just getting a cheap product. And what is important for us is that it's ethically made. And that's what, that's what you know, is the main driving force for, for us as Western. Fashion is also a vehicle for capacity building. A lot of this work has the hand. And so I think it's wonderful if you can transfer something that has that human design made from the transmission of their brain to their hand. And I think that's wonderful if you can include it in fashion. My biggest hope at the moment is in what you call it bottom up. You know, it's on the ground doing these projects. And from what my research, what I'm trying to do, what I'm trying to find out and what I'm trying to filter into and help, it, it, I have found that there are thousands and of individuals and charities and NGOs doing this hands-on, start from here, go in there, do this, do that and the other, and find by experience what it's, what, how you find the structure to make things change. I I'm traumatized by the problem of climate change. It's really changed my life. My outlook on the world is completely different. In fact, um, I think that everybody's outlook on the world is completely different once this idea ever gets in their head. The human race never looked out on, on such a future.
control over their lives, and therefore they can choose not to have to exploit the environment because they have another way of earning some money. If you want to address poverty, you have to bring work. It's value creation for the poorest of the poor, for those who are usually excluded from the global economy, but who can take part in it if given the opportunity. You know, we're not here to make a charity t-shirt. We're here to make a product, and why not come here? There's a, there's a skill base that, that is being developed, which is good, but they're capable of doing you know, great things. From my whole experience here, the thing that really touched me and really meant something to me more than anything was the photographer, Jürgen Teller. The thing that really touched me is something Jürgen said before he left. And I realised that he's probably one of those people who gets everything by direct experience. And he really, really cares about human beings and their relationships. And so somehow, what, what because he told me how stimulating. Also, I think what he really got out of it is that we bring magic to those human relationships. I love my job because it does not me to go on with my life. So I gain from it. It has helped me a lot. I am proud of it. It's quite incredible to, to think that um, we might save the world through fashion. one of the IDC projects with Vivian Wasworth. Uh, the bat that was shown in the video was sold in, for instance, the, Jap the Japanese department, like, for instance, Isetan department in Tokyo, or you know, it should be Shinjuku, but anyway. Um, so this is a very appreciated project by donors, and Japan is the one of the major contributors of this uh, Echo Fashion Project. Um, by the way, this is sort of disclosed information, and I'd like to circulate tell you that Japan has been thinking, uh, considering about uh, making some uh, contribution to other activities other than you know the Echo Fashion Project. So, if anybody has any brilliant idea to you know help the Japanese government to decide which project to, you know, to provide a contribution. Um, th those ideas should be very, very welcome. I can tell some, you know, diplomats or the policy makers to make the make Japanese government contribute to IGC. So, um, this is actually in some bits Next two slides is the thing that I wanted to tell you today. Uh, we have to realize the trade assistance is very important, not only because uh, it contributes to developing countries' uh, economic growth and development, but also because it is beneficial, beneficial for assistance providers like Japan. How so? A lot of people look at the positive impacts in beneficiary countries like developing countries 
for instance, expansion of products or you know, the expansion of exports or reducing some costs. But at the same time, when the industry in developing countries achieve the economy of scale, the price of goods should go down, which leads to that in providing countries like donors, like Japan, cost of inputs uh, goes down and productivity should rise. Um, can anybody think of any further uh, positive impacts rather than this, this chart between uh, the positive impacts between uh, beneficiaries and providers? Any further steps between them? Further steps than you know the expanding the productivity in providers. It goes another positive impact should go back to beneficiaries, which should also bring the positive impacts back to providers. Any other ideas? Um, well, increasing productivity in providing countries leads to more demand, not only primary products, but also more higher intermediate products. Uh, like, for instance, you can look up Vietnam. Vietnam used to be an exporter of primary commodities, like primary, primary uh, like agricultural commodities, like rice, agricultural products. But now, Japan, the Japanese company moves to Vietnam to, you know, assemble the car or some, uh, to, uh, to build the, the parts of the car or some electricity and then back, import back to Japan. Why they do? Because it's cheaper than they do in Japan. So this is some, you know, like higher, how do you say, it, like, higher positive impacts, like could go back to the beneficiary countries. So uh, beneficiaries can gain spillovers of knowledge and know-how and improve labor skills through expansion of product production of intermediate goods. So then they would they become able to produce more value added products, which is very important for them to achieve the substantial growth. So a providing country can benefit from less cost for even for the intermediate goods and inputs. So this kind of trade assistance can make a positive circle between uh, beneficiaries and providers. Don't worry, we're heading to the end. So, as you might have already uh, realized, only financial assistance is not enough for developing countries. It is important to build capacity of human resources, both in institutional and administrative, who actually manages and rules in limited resources. In order to achieve uh, sustainable economic development, it is essential to provide assistance in both hard and soft ways. The hard assistance we call include, uh, includes uh, supply side capacity building and transportation. Supply side capacity can be strengthened through uh, enhancing export competitiveness and effective industrial policy with effective incentives and economic, the achieving economic scale and skills of labor and, and uh, uh, effective market strategy and so on. And transportation, as I mentioned earlier, includes the building, 
you know, economic infrastructure such as ports, railways, and power plants, and so on. And this is important that they should uh, establish the effective customs. So customs is the office, they manage the tariffs or some imports and exports. So if they have bad capacity in customs, those importing goods stop at the office and then they don't go into the country. So the establishment of the better custom is very important uh, aspect too. And as for the soft uh, assistance, should include uh, legislation capacity and negotiation capacity. Legislative capacity would be needed to implement commitments they made under WTO and to promote export industries with, uh, with effective industrial policy. Uh, enhancing negotiation capacity would be also critical for them to gain more market opportunities through negotiations and to get less restrictive commitments, which, uh, which, would, uh, re uh, which would avoid or refrain the domestic, industrial, uh, domestic industries to grow further uh, in order to enable export industry to grow. So, what I wanted to stress in this presentation the most here is that it is essential to provide balanced assistance between soft and hard in order, to, in order for developing countries to achieve meaningful and sustainable growth and economic development. So, uh, this this is the, the number of the Japanese representation in Japan, especially in these three organizations. When you look at the WTO, there are four Japanese staffs out of 629 in uh, 2012, which uh, accounts 0.6% of the old staff, while the budgetary contribution to the WTO is about 5%. And as for the UNCTAD, there are nine Japanese staff out of about 400, which accounts 2.25%, even though the budgetary uh, contribution to the United Nations of Japan uh, accounts 12.53%. And when you look at IDC, there is now zero out of 266. As you saw the video or some of the explanation, ITC is doing very uh, good trade assistance in the business side, and that is very appreciated. But this is very unfortunate that there is no Japanese staff in ITC. But in till this last summer, there are, there there was one Japanese, staff, <coughs> but they moved to the WTO. I mean, she moved to the. This is very unfortunate. And when you look at other United Nations organizations like UNHCR, High, High Commission of Re for Refugees, or International Labor Union, Labor Union organizations, there are 61 uh, third or 38 Japanese staff. Well, this still accounts like a little percent, percentage of the staff, but in the trade area, Japanese staff, Jap Japan, Japan is very, very underrepresented. So what the Japanese, the staff of Japan do in those uh, organizations? They can do connect the organization with its government and keep updated the information of activities uh, or assistance and draw capital's attention on their activities and to bring projects and contributions from the government. This, uh, this role of Jap Japanese staff should be quite important to uh, make higher uh, represent, uh, represent of Japan. So uh, I'd like to call the people who work in this trade field trade mafia. Well, I would say Kobayashi Sensei and me are also trade mafia. 
as this world is quite small, and once we get into this world, we know each other almost everywhere we go. Uh, for instance, I studied in the master program uh, in Bern, Switzerland, uh, two years ago. And uh, well, that, that master program is on the WTO. And it's alumni, and my friend that I met two years ago in the program, uh, those are uh, currently work in of course Geneva because those uh, you know the, those organizations are there, but including also law firms, and uh, some of them are the government officials in Ghana, uh, Tanzania, Peru, India, Bhutan, Kyrgyzstan, and Kazakhstan, and some of them from European Commission in Brussels. And as well as a huge exporting company, alcohol exporting company in Brussels, and trade consulting agency in Singapore and Botswana. You can, I mean, you can easily imagine, I, we have like trade mafia in all over the world, and I am very proud of that, you know, I mean, I'm very proud of that I have all the people and friends uh, all over the world in this trade mafia. So now I'd like to ask you, how do you think you can get involved in this trade area to be a trade mafia? Any, like, any suggestions? How, how can be a trade mafia? What kind of option they have? <laughs> how, can I, how can I become part of yes, the trade? Yes, how can I be, how can we become a part of the trade? Other than starting my own business, maybe? Yeah, uh, well, that, that could be the one of the yeah. problems, but, yes. you know, the, doing the business, like it's for business. I, I also imagine um, on the intellectual side as well. Mm -hmm. um, Academics. Yeah, I can look at of, of trade. Mm -hmm. That's very, like what I said, yes. Yeah. yeah. You have to study in Zika. Well, that's a good <laughs> option. I mean, that's very option for us to be a trade mafia because once you go there, you know, you know quite a lot of people who's getting involved in this field. You know, mm. Other than academics and business. How about as a consumer purchasing the products? Oh, that could be the part of but I'm I'm sorry that but we don't call them trade mafia. You know, mm -hmm. mafia is more, you know, sort of specialized or like with uh, some, uh, <coughs> not expertise, but mm -hmm. like it could be bad expertise, or, but should be positive. Well, of course, I mean, we're all consumer that, you know, we buy, we buy the bags, I mean, or clothes made in China, Bangladesh, Vietnam. No, but this is the part of the trade, uh, trade world, yes. Trade market, we need to buy some legal background. No, no, no. <laughs> no, it shouldn't be informal or, you know, like Yakuza. But, I mean, like uh, people who, who are in this, you know, trade world. I, I want to call trade mafia because we call each other trade mafia. even though I did. Okay. You are so Japanese. So, how do you trade mafia? Okay. Well, one of the options, as I was telling you, like, through this presentation, could be, you know, international professional staff in the, those uh, trade organizations. Like they do uh, manage activities, analysis and policy recommendations, and so on. And another is diplomats. Diplomats engage in the negotiation and to get the market opportunity or market access or some 
you know, regulations, or negotiate the text of agreements that could have the huge impacts on uh, the country's regulations. So, policy makers, of course, they make policies. So that influences the trade. So they do legislation and uh, you know establish the regulations. In economics, as he has he suggested, of course, like Kobayashi Sensei made special I mean, very you know knowledgeable analysis or excellent publication to you know to enhance the recognitions or some expertise. And as I told before in uh, the project of Virtual Institute in Nakta, academics can also provide capacity building to other policy makers or diplomats from uh, developing countries. So researchers and advisors, like I did in the government two years ago, for two years, they do analysis and some policy recommendations. Uh, the, those researchers and advisors are not necessarily only work for the international organizations. They can be a development consultant, like you know, researchers at the institute or um, whatsoever. And the last one should be a trade lawyer. Trade includes the dispute settlement process. If you find another country is violating some rules or regulation on the WTO, they can sue them. So in order to sue them, you need a lawyer. And trade lawyer should have uh, the very, uh, how do you say, like uh, higher or complicated expertise to uh, make, to collect the information or make the submissions or, you know, in order, which is necessary for litigation. Uh, WTO has the dispute settlement mechanism, and uh, and uh, there there has been there have been uh, more than 400 cases in the WTO since 1995. So, well, it's, it's it's been a really long presentation, but this is all about my presentation today. Thank you for listening. And if you have any kind of question, as I told at the beginning of the presentation, even it could be personal or related to the presentation, it's very, very welcome. Thank you very much.